100, Chapter 4. Okay, in this chapter, we are going over cells, how those are organized, what the difference is between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, as well as what is in a eukaryotic cell. So, starting off with cells are our fundamental units of life, right? They're the building blocks of all organisms. In a single-celled organism, that's all the organism is. It's just a cell. In multicellular organisms, um, you know, you have lots of different cells working together, usually different kinds. And as you get into multicellular organisms, the organisms become more complex. The cells often become more complex. Um, so it really just depends on what kind of organism we're looking at. But we're starting with these are the basic building blocks of life. And it's one of the main scientific theories that is undisputed is that all living things are made of cells. Okay, so multicellular organisms are organized in a hierarchy. So we're starting here at the smallest and working our way to the largest. So we start with our basic unit, which is cells. And when you get a bunch of interconnected cells that have a common function, like they're all working towards one common goal, essentially, that is referred to as a tissue. Okay. So think about this in, in terms of your own body or an animal body, um, let's say, it's, or any eukaryotic organism, which remember is um, animals, plants, fungi. Um, so again, cells, and then we get into tissues. Several tissues then combine to form an organ, right? And then organs working together make up an organ system. And then you get all of these systems working together to make up an entire organism. So we have different tissues, and then you have organs like our kidney, our heart, our liver, and then those work together to make up an organ system, so like our digestive system, our respiratory system, and all of those together and more um, make up us as a human or, you know, many animals. All right, so the underlying principle of biology that I briefly mentioned already, cell theory, its cells are the basic units of life. All living organisms are made of cells, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. Okay. Cells have four common components. So all cells, no matter whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic, have these four common components. Eukaryotic cells have more, um, more things that we'll talk about soon, but all prokaryotes and eukaryotes have these. One, they have a plasma membrane, which is what separates the cell's interior from the environment. So you'll see here this cell membrane. You'll, you'll hear it referred to as different things. Um, cell membrane, plasma membrane. Sometimes you'll hear phospholipid bilayer um, membrane. You'll, you'll hear different things, but usually cell membrane or um, plasma membrane. And then inside... We have the cytoplasm, which is made of cytosol. It's almost like a, um, it's just an aqueous solution that has all the other components of the cell. All of them also have DNA. Eukaryotic DNA is in a nucleus. Prokaryotic DNA looks just like this. It's a single circular DNA molecule, just kind of free floating in here. And then all of them also have ribosomes, which are all these little dots you see in here are protein synthesizers. We'll talk more about these in a little bit, but all, all cells have these four things, plasma membrane, cytoplasm, DNA, and ribosomes. Okay, so getting into the characteristics of prokaryotes. So these guys are our simple organisms, and for the most part, when we talk about them, we're talking about bacteria. Um, these are the ones that lack membrane-enclosed internal compartments, like a nucleus, a mitochondria, etc. But they do have those four things we just discussed, the DNA, the cell membrane, um, the cytoplasm, and the ribosomes. So keep in mind, a cell membrane is different than a cell wall. All prokaryotes are, have a cell wall. Most of them have one containing peptidoglycan. So these are our bacteria, and this is important because this is actually how antibiotics work. So this is why if you go to the doctor and you have the flu, a virus, and they give you antibiotics, 
you should not take those antibiotics because antibiotics work specifically on bacteria. And if you're taking antibiotics when you shouldn't be, or if you're not doing the whole course of antibiotics like you should be, that's how we actually develop resistant bacteria. And that's what gets us in the hospital and what gets us into um, a lot of health issues because we want to make sure that we can kill off the bacteria, right? And the way we do it is with antibiotics and they actually, like penicillin, attack this cell wall made out of peptidoglycan. So they attack that cell wall, essentially dissolving it in, in some sorts, and that cell will then kind of just explode. Um, it's a very simplified version, but that's essentially what antibiotics do, and they can do it because prokaryotes have a cell wall. And prokaryotes are believed to be very much like the first cells, um, and we see prokaryotes in the domains archaea, which is our like extremophiles for the most part. So uh, prokaryotes that live in really extreme environments, like uh, really acidic or basic or very high or low temperature, those kind of things, as well as bacteria. structure of a prokaryotic cell. So our chromosomal DNA here, we do not have a nucleus, so it's organized or localized in a nucleoid. Um, it's essentially, usually, honestly, just free-floating here, kind of coiled up. You can see here chromosomal DNA coiled up, just kind of free-floating through the cytoplasm. Um, the ribosomes, those little dots, I always kind of say studded with ribosomes. Those are our protein synthesizers. Those are just studded within the cytoplasm. And the cell membrane is surrounded by a cell wall. So we have the cell membrane here, and then you see the cell wall just outside of it. And the cell wall, again, is that peptidoglycan layer that we can break apart with antibiotics. The other structures shown um, may be present in some, but not necessarily all bacteria. Like some of them may have this flagellum or this pili. Um, these are used essentially to, for, for movement. Um, and there's lots of different diseases that have these kind of things and are able to move better through our body, um, as well as an external capsule. So these are not in all of them, but in, in quite a few of them. So because these are, are more simple and they're usually unicellular, they are smaller than eukaryotic cells, right? The surface area to volume ratio is more favorable for moving material in and out of the cell. It's a reason why we do want these to be a little bit smaller. Um, and they also lack the modifications found in eukaryotes that aid internal transport, which we'll talk about a little bit later getting into eukaryotic characteristics. So a little bit more on that surface area to volume ratio. As the cells get bigger, volume increases faster than surface area. So essentially, we just don't have space for these things, especially our, our unicellular organisms that are so much smaller. Okay, getting into eukaryotic cells. So this is, again, our animals, plants, and fungi. And these are more complex organisms, usual, or sorry, more complex cells and more complex organisms. All of these organisms, for our purposes, um, or we can say most of them are multicellular, meaning that there's many of these cells within the organism. But even if they are unicellular, they're still eukaryotic cells are much more complicated. We can see here, compared to the prokaryotic cell, how much more is involved here. And again, we can still have things like flagellum or cilia um, that are off to the side here. But there are also many membrane-bound organelles that is what makes the eukaryotic cells different. Okay, so eukaryotic plasma membrane is also a little bit different, a little bit more complex than prokaryotes. Um, we have this phospholipid bilayer again with our hydrophilic um, heads and our hydrophobic tails, and we'll talk more about that actually in the next chapter. Um, as well as all of these channels that we have here that can, you know, take in different uh, proteins and uh, d different things like that that can go through these channels that are specific to that cell. Okay, so 
again, we still have these four basic things, right? We have the cytoplasm, and it's the same thing in a prokaryote as a eukaryote. It's a region between the plasma membrane and, in this case, the nuclear envelope. So this is what holds all of our organelles, and it's within this cytosol that's in the cytoplasm. And it's kind of like a jelly-like solution. It's not super jelly, but just a little bit. 70-80% um, of it is water, but again, kind of a solid, semi-solid consistency due to proteins within it. All right, so one of the major differences is membrane-bound organelles in general, but a nucleus, right? So usually only one per cell, and it is the largest organelle. And if you're ever looking through a microscope and you're looking at cells, the nucleus is usually the one that's easy to spot. It's like the circle, usually a darker circle, depending on your staining of that um, slide, but usually like a darker circle within the cell. And it's bigger itself than most prokaryotic cells, which is interesting. And it holds all of our DNA, right? Or all of the organism's DNA. I'm talking about we're, we're eukaryotes too. So uh, as humans, we have the same setup. But you can see here we have the chromatin, our kind of coiled DNA, essentially. We have the nucleoplasm, nucleoplasm, which is kind of the cytoplasm of the nucleus, our nucleolus here in the middle, um, or not necessarily in the middle, but that's like our another little circle here, a nuclear pore, and a nuclear envelope. So the nuclear envelope is kind of like the cell wall of the nucleus, essentially. It's kind of what's protecting and encasing everything there. And then on the outside, we'll see this endoplasmic reticulum that we'll talk about soon. So the nuclear envelope, um, this organelle has a double membrane, and it's what separates the DNA from the cytoplasm, and it also separates transcription from translation. So that's the difference um, in the DNA, how we're transcribing and translating. Uh, so transcribing the DNA, kind of making a copy, and then translating that into proteins. Uh, these happen in different areas, and we'll get into that more throughout the semester, but just know that this is the place that it does happen. And the nuclear pores, those little gaps that you see, those are um, perforating the membrane, and it connect the nucleoplasm to the cytoplasm. So you do have these little um, kind of junctions here, and it regulates the flow of molecules back and forth. But you do see larger molecules, they need what's called an NLS, or a nuclear localization signal, in order to pass. And the nucleolus, like I said, is kind of like the darker region of the nucleus, and sometimes it's a little easier to see. But that's where the ribosomes are assembled from RNA and proteins. Okay, so our ribosomes, these are in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and they're basically our protein synthesizers. So... They're made out of two different sized subunits, um, and they're slightly larger in eukaryotes than they are in prokaryotes, but they're made of a special RNA. We refer to it as rRNA, R for ribosomes, and proteins. Okay. Um, during protein synthesis, ribosomes here are the ones that assemble amino acids into proteins. So again, I often refer to them as protein synthesizers. And then our mitochondria, and anyone know what mitochondria is, or mitochondria. So this is often referred to, if you remember from like elementary science, this is our powerhouse of the cell. This is where we convert our stored energy from our macromolecule and molecular bonds. So all of those carbs and um, fats and everything that you ate that turned into ATP, this is where we're storing that energy um, as ATP, okay? Uh, part of the mitochondrion does have an inner membrane, and it is folded. The folds are called cristae, and then we have an area within it known as the mitochondrial matrix. And we'll get more into this later in the semester. This is the place where respiration um, takes place uh, or fermentation. So, depending on if we are aerobic with oxygen or anaerobic without oxygen um, and how we produce ATP, essentially. So we'll, we'll be talking about that later in the semester, but just know that this is where it takes place in the mitochondria or the powerhouse of the cell.
Protozoans. These guys are small rounded organelles enclosed by a single membrane. And they basically have reactions that break down fatty acids and amino acids here. And they can also potentially detoxify poisons. So these are not found in um, plant cells, really. They're in animals. And just a quick contrast between animal and plant cells, they are different. They are both eukaryotic, but they do have a couple different things. So both have a microtubial organizing center or an MO, sorry, MTOC, but animal cells also have centrioles associated with that. And it's called a centrosome. And so we'll we'll probably see more about that later in the semester. I'm not too worried about that. But animal cells have the centrosome and lysosomes, but plant cells do not. Plant cells also have a cell wall. Their cell wall is made out of something called cellulose. So it is different than prokaryotes. So remember the difference there. Um, and they also have chloroplasts and other specialized plastids and a large central vacuole. Animal cells do not have these. So for the most part, as a eukaryotic organism, they do share all the same organelles except for what is on this page. So again, animal cells have these two things, centrosome and lysosome, that plant cells don't. And plants have cell wall, chloroplasts, and a central vacuole. Okay, so looking at the animal cell here. So again, we see our nucleus. That's in in all eukaryotic cells. Um, and we can see peroxisomes here, like I said, and lysosomes that we do not have in the plant cells. Looking at a plant cell here, you can see they're a little different. They're a little bit different shaped, um, but some of the same organelles like our nucleus, our Golgi, our ribosomes, our mitochondria, um, and we do have peroxisomes here. I think I misspoke on that last time, but uh, no lysosomes and no uh, centrosome, which is kind of hard to see in this anyways, uh, or in the animal cell even. But we do have a cell wall made out of cellulose that helps maintain the shape of the plant that's kind of here on the outside, as well as a central vacuole. So this is essentially like to help water the plant, right? So it's got cell sap that maintains the pressure against the cell wall, and it's kind of like an extra little, um, I mean, I don't want to say water tank because it's not water necessarily, but it helps maintain the structure of the plant as well as kind of keeping it um happy okay and then we also have these chloroplasts these are also really easy to see through a microscope in most cases you'll see like green little ovals or something um in the plant cell those are chloroplasts this is where our photosynthesis actually takes place okay the centrosome so this is what we see in animal cells but not in plant cells and it consists of two centrioles that lie at right angles to each other and each centriole is a cylinder made out of nine triplets of microtubules. Non-tubulin proteins, which are the green lines, hold all of these microtubule triplets together. Okay. Um, so again, this is only in the animal cells, not in the plants. And then we get into what makes plants unique. And again, it's made out of, uh, their cell wall is made out of cellulose. This is the cellulose molecule. You do not need to know what the cellulose molecule looks like. Just know that it's made out of cellulose, while prokaryotic cell walls, like bacterial cell walls, are made out of peptidoglycan. So this is a rigid protective structure external to our plasma membrane, and it just gives the plant structure, provides a little bit of protection for it. Um, and that's similar to what it does in bacterial cells as well, or prokaryotic cells, they have the same structure, or sorry, the same function, but they're made out of different things. Chloroplasts, again, these are a site of photosynthesis. These are the green little ovals that you'll see within a plant cell. They are double membrane bound organelles. They have their own ribosomes and DNA like mitochondria, and their inner membrane encloses an aqueous fluid called stroma that has a set of interconnected and stacked fluid filled membrane sacs and these are called thylakoids and each one of these is a granum or plural grana okay 
Um, the main thing to know is that this is the site of photosynthesis. Like I said, our central vacuole here. So they've got that large central vacuole that occupies most of the area of the cell, and it helps regulate water concentration under changing environmental conditions and contributes to cell expansion as well. So we'll talk a little bit about tonicities um, in our next chapter, but you can see here what plant cells look like in different conditions. Hypertonic, isotonic, meaning it's similar concentration inside and outside, or hypotonic. So this depends on the concentration inside and outside of the cell and how molecules move between those depending on that concentration. Okay, endosymbiosis. So this is a theory essentially of how, how cells essentially got more complex, how we got membrane-bound organelles that we see in the eukaryotic cells. And it's hypothesized that mitochondria and chloroplast originated actually as independent prokaryotic organisms. So they started as those, you know, small unicellular cells, and then they became endosymbionts of the prokaryotic prokaryotic ancestors of the eukaryotes. So in addition to having their own DNA and ribosomes, the size of these organelles is similar to that of the independent prokaryotes. So it kind of, you know, contributes to this theory. Um, there's a lot of original research done by Lynn Margulis, and we'll discuss more of this later, but essentially I think of this as like a Pac-Man thing. So you have, um, a prokaryotic cell here let's say and over time basically another prokaryotic cell ate that and you know this isn't size for scale but we have this one that engulfed this one and now you have a membrane bound cell here and this is now what we would consider like our prokaryote our sorry our like our mitochondria that came from a prokaryotic cell so that's what endosymbiosis is and we also have endomembrane system, and this consists of internal membranes and organelles within all of our eukaryotic cells, and they work together to modify package and transport lipids and proteins. It includes things like our nuclear envelope, lysosomes, and vesicles, um, as well as our endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus and plasma membrane. All right, so our lysosomes, these are the ones that are only in the animal cells. And they do contain digestive enzymes, so they help break down really large biomolecules and even worn out organelles. So these are our um, kind of digestive breaking down food particles uh, type of thing. Uh, so you can see why animal cells would have these and plant cells wouldn't. Plant cells wouldn't need this, right? They're not, they're not actively consuming things, they're photosynthesizing whereas animals do rely on eating either plants or other animals to survive. Okay, our endoplasmic reticulum, I'll often refer to it as the ER. We have two, two parts of the ER. So we have what's called a rough ER as well as a smooth ER. But the ER in general is interconnected membranous sacs and tubules. You'll see them here, right? And the rough ER is studded with all of these ribosomes, and that's what modifies our proteins. And then the smoother ER is actually what synthesizes lipids. Okay, So the hollow portion of the ER tubules you'll see here is called the lumen or cisternal space. And the membrane of the ER is continuous with the nuclear envelope. So this is kind of surrounding our nucleus like you saw earlier. And our rough endoplasmic ER, our, our endoplasmic reticulum has the ribosomes attached to it. These are the new proteins getting modified and folding um, in the lumen of the rough ER. And modified proteins are either incorporated into cellular membranes or secreted from the cell, like protein hormones, enzymes, that kind of thing. But we have our ribosomes, our protein synthesizers on our rough ER, and that's how we're going through and modifying um, in that way. So the RER also makes phospholipids for cellular membranes. And the phospholipids or modified proteins are not going to stay there. 
They're going to reach their destinations via these little transport vesicles that bud from the rough ER's membrane. So you can see we have our proteins that we're synthesizing here and we're getting ready to export. And then they're going to go into their little transport vesicle. So it's like we're packaging them up and then we're sending them into a box here to get shipped out. You can see the smooth ER a little bit better here off to the side. And this is, again, where we're going through production. Okay. And it's continuous with the rough ER, but it doesn't have any ribosomes or very few if it does on its cytoplasmic crisps. And it'll synthesize carbohydrates, lipids, and steroid hormones. Also detoxifies um, medications and poisons and stores a lot of calcium as well. In muscle cells, we actually have a specialized smooth ER called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which stores calcium needed to coordinate contractions of the muscle cells. So we'll get into this more as we get into muscles later on in the semester. Okay, up next we have our Golgi apparatus. So once we've synthesized our proteins and we've packaged them up nicely in our transport vesicle, then we are going to send them to be sorted, packaged, and tagged to get to the right place. So this is all of our lipids and proteins from the ER coming into the Golgi apparatus. And then the Golgi apparatus is like our, kind of like our post office, basically. It's going to figure out where everything's going. It's going to sort it, package it, tag it. Um, and we also often refer to this as the Golgi body. And it's just a series of flattened membranes. And it's basically taking everything from the ER and doing its thing with it and then it's going to send it out as well into these vesicles. Well the receiving side is called the cis face and the opposite side is called the trans face. So transport vesicles from the ER fuse with the cis face. So cis is next to the ER basically and it's going to empty the contents into the lumen of the Golgi and as the proteins and lipids travel through the Golgi, they're going to get further modified so that they can be sorted, working its way through our post office, basically. And then um, as we're doing that, we're going to be adding short chains of sugar molecules as well. And then, sorry, I, I thought I had another slide showing it going into the transport vesicles that then take it to where it needs to go in the cell or in the body. Okay, up next we have the cytoskeleton. This is just a network of protein fibers and it's helping maintain the shape of the cell. It also holds some organelles in specific position and allows movement of cytoplasm and vesicles within the cell. Um, it it kind of gives the cell both a structure and kind of a network within it as well. And it enables cells within multicellular organisms to move. So we've got three components of a cytoskeleton. We have microfilaments. You'll see these little guys here, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. They all have different sizes and different functions. You'll see here are microfilaments. These are the ones that are involved in movement. So these are either the whole cell or they're found in the internal parts, and they determine and stabilize our shape as well and they're made from what's called actin monomers. And we'll hear more about actin once we get into muscles too. Our microtubules, these are the rigid internal skeleton for some cells. So they're providing the framework for motor proteins to move structures within the cell. And they're made out of something called tubulin dimers. Um, don't really need to know this part, but know that they're providing the rigid internal skeleton. And then cilia and flagella, they were kind of briefly mentioned earlier. They're on many prokaryotic uh, cells and some eukaryotic, and these are ultra structures. So they're kind of outside of it. Cilia are usually shorter and more numerous, and their beating patterns differ. But the main thing to know about cilia and flagella is that they are how cells move within the body or within other cells. Okay. More extracellular structure, again, our plant cell wall provides support, a barrier to infection. And it also has these things called plasmodesmata connect cells. So that's what we'll talk about here in a second. Um, whereas our extracellular matrix in animals, we have 
collagens and other fibrous proteins, as well as something called glycoproteins or proteoglycans and linking proteins. So it's essentially a way for cells to link up with each other and pass proteins back and forth that we see in our extracellular matrix in animals or within our plasmodesmata in the plant cell walls. So these intercellular junctions provide direct channels of communication between cells and plants and animals do it differently. Again, plants have this plasmodesmata, so they're channels that just pass between cell walls and plants to connect cytoplasm and allow materials to move from cell to cell. So you can see here the two cells, and we have the plasma desmata here in the middle. That's connecting them and just kind of creating like a little highway. We we'll have tight junctions. These are watertight seals between animal cells, and these ones prevent materials from leaking between the cells. And they're found in a lot of epithelial cells um, in our internal organs and cavities. So it's just keeping things separated that need to be separated and helping allow passage of other things as well. But these are the watertight seals in animal cells. Plasmosomes um, are also seen in animals, and these are short, short proteins in the plasma. You can see them here. Um, plasma membrane that act as spot welds. So they're joining cells and tissues that stretch, like our heart, our lung, our muscles, and again, allowing for a passage there. Then we have gap junctions that are also connecting our animal cells. So this is kind of like our des uh, desmomata, or plasma desmata in plant cells. Um, because they're forming channels that allow ions and nutrients, other stuff to move between cells. And they develop when six proteins form kind of like this donut-like structure. So important thing to know, plasma desmata in plants, gap junctions in animal cells. And these are protein line pores. And again, they're allowing water, small molecules to pass between adjacent animal cells. And that is essentially the the basic functions of all the organelles within eukaryotic organisms the differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic and then within eukaryotic organisms the difference we see between plant and animal cells